Well, good morning, everyone. If you would, please stand to your feet. We are so honored to have you today. I'm telling you, it's going to be off the charts today. So I pray that your expectation is beginning to build because it is going to be incredible in this house today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, today we come bowing our hearts before you. God, we thank you that you are the audience of one that we are after today. We come to extend our praise and lift our worship to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place today. Invade our lives. God, it is our prayer that today, that God, you would open up the heavens, that God, you would release healing, you would release deliverance, Deliverance. You would release words of encouragement and comfort and strength to every heart that's in this place today. So, God, it is with that anticipation that we say, God, come. We invite you. We welcome you. We praise your holy name. If you're in agreement with that today, let's give God praise. Come on. Amen.
Faithfulness is true, yes, Jesus, I believe, 
faith and we put our trust in you this morning God we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise because you are worthy not just for what you can do for us because it's who you are we exalt your name the one who gave everything laid your life down for us I pray that's a revelation for someone this morning that the God of all creation gave his one and only son for you, simply for you, not for what you can do, not for how good you are or how faithful you are or what you can achieve in this world, but simply because you are you. He created you for a purpose. God, you're so worthy. We're gonna transition into worship and I wanted to read this verse. This is Psalms 113. It says, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, you his servants. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be praised both now and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to the place where it sets, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is exalted over all the nations. Hallelujah his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, the one who sits enthroned on high? He stoops down to look upon the earth. Hallelujah. He sees us. He sees us at all times. And isn't he just good to be worshiped? He's just good to be worshiped. Come on, in your own voice. God, we worship you. Lord, we worship you. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. Yes, you're worthy. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your name is great. Your name is great. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to praise the name of the Lord this morning.
Father, it is with an incredibly humble heart that we bow our lives to you in this place today. Father, there is none like you. Father, we thank you and we praise you for your love that abounds through Christ Jesus, that there would not be one of us without the love of a saving Father. 
There would not be one of us without the compassion and the mercy and the grace of a heavenly Father that loves us so much, that gave his absolute best in Christ Jesus, that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want to know if there's any whosoever's in this place today that has declared Jesus as the Lord of their life. Come on, let's give God one more shout of praise because he deserves all glory and all honor. We praise you, God. We exalt you in the mighty name of Jesus. Woo! My goodness, come on. I'm telling you what, if that doesn't get fire in your belly, then your wood is extremely wet, praise God. But I believe God's going to do something incredible in your life today. There is, there is, listen, there is nothing more spectacular than the people of God coming together and releasing a voice of worship and praise unto the one eternal God. I'm telling you, there's a world that's gone crazy out there, but I'm so thankful that the church is still here, that the kingdom of heaven is still advancing, that God is still moving in a mighty way in this hour. Amen. Amen. I just want to commend you for your worship this morning. That was absolutely amazing. The Bible says that God inhabits the praises of his people. And I'm telling you, you you, you gave God something to inhabit this morning. The Bible says that better is one day in his courts than a thousand elsewhere. There's no better place to be than in the presence of God. There's no better place to be than in the worship of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Amen. No better place to be. We're so honored that you're with us today. I'm telling you, uh, your your life is going to be enlarged. Your faith is going to be so increased today because of my my dear friend that I begin I, I I met this past summer, and my heart has just leaped every time that I've had the opportunity uh, to talk with him. We talked yesterday afternoon, and and uh, we could have just kept going for a long time, Keith. It was incredible, and so it's going to be a blessing to your life today. Now, listen, young people, you. Usually we, we release our young people, the first grade through the sixth grade. But today, this message is for every person that is in this house today. And so, young people, you're going to stay with your parents uh, right now. I know you guys love Abby, and I know you love Faith Kids. But what you're going to hear today is going to enlarge uh, your tent stakes. It's going to expand your heart today. So we wanted all the family to be together in the service. But what I am going to do is give you just two minutes. Would you get out of your aisle, get out of your row, give somebody a high five, let them know that you're glad that they're here today. We'll be right back with you. Oh, it's good. Amen. 
Amen. Well, church, we're so honored to have you today. Listen, I just have one announcement because I don't want to take up any more time. I want to get Keith up here as quick as I possibly can. But Iron Men, listen, if you are here, men of God, then we want to see you next Saturday morning at 8 a.m. Join us for our, our prayer breakfast. We are praying over our families. Uh, and so we want you to, we're going to fix an incredible breakfast for you. But men, if you haven't been uh, in, a, in a while, w- would you just make a priority next Saturday just to set aside some time from, from 8 to 9.30, come and join us. And just, just as a man of God, ju- just come and uh, begin to be a part of an atmosphere of faith that will encourage you, but also be a blessing to, to your family as well. And so if you are going to come, we're going to put a number for you up on the screens right there. It is. You can text that number right there. Just let us know that you're coming because, you know, I don't want to run short on biscuits and gravy. Arr, 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 arr. Yeah. Hmm? Huh? So I don't want to run short on that. So I want to make sure that, you, 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 that we have enough. So men, take a picture of that screen. Text that number later. And, uh, and we will, that'll let us know that you're coming. Just say, I'm in. And, uh, and uh, that, that'll let us know because I want to make sure we've got plenty for you. I just have a, a dream on my heart that where we would come together and we would see 100 men coming and praying for their families. Wouldn't that be incredible? Wouldn't that be amazing? And, and, uh, and I know it starts somewhere. And the Bible says when you get the man, then you get the entire house. And the leadership spiritually in the house literally is upon the man of God to take that mantle of leadership and lead. You don't have to be articulate. You don't have to be the best verse, but just simply pausing for God, leading your family closer to God. It makes a difference, and God wants to make a difference in your home. Do you believe that? Amen? Amen. Well, listen, church, I, I am, I've been looking forward to this for, for some time, and, and, and Keith Wheeler has carried this cross that sits right before me over 25,000 uh, foot miles. That's a long time. That's a long way. He's been in 180 different countries, been in all seven continents of this, of this uh, planet. And so I'm telling you, uh, when, when a man literally uh, responds in obedience to God, it's amazing the doors that open. You know, you may be here today, and you may never be called by the Lord to, to pick up a cross and, and wheel this across seven different countenances. But can I tell you something? You have the message of cross that dwells in you, and I'm, if he can take it to seven different countenances, then there's that family member, there's that coworker that surrounds you that needs the message that you have. But today, I'm telling you, your faith is going to be increased. Hope's going to come alive in your heart today. If you're ready to receive the word, then would you please stand to your feet, give a warm, warm welcome to my good brother, Keith Wheeler as he comes this morning. I'm so honored to have you. Come on. Yes. Go ahead and be seated. What a, what a beautiful honor to be able to be with you guys. Uh, this, is, this is my princess. This is Nicole, and it's the best love story that you'll ever hear. I won't tell you this morning, but I promise you, you've never met two people more head over heels, crazy in love with you. And I'm just going to let her say hello and greet you. Hi, I just wanted to say hi. And what a beautiful surprise. Just a, a beautiful church. We were driving and driving. And I thought, okay, we're going to arrive to a small little. But this has just been a wonderful surprise. And just the, the worship was great. And so thanks for having us. Thank you. And, and I just want to echo what she said. Um, I, as, as we came in and we began to worship together with you guys, I, I leaned over to Pastor and I said, I don't know in so many years of traveling around the world, speaking, carrying the cross, have I ever been so surprised? And that's the truth. I, I have never been so taken back and, and, and not just, there's a lot of you. That's, that's a surprise. I, I, you, you have to understand, I, I go to all kinds of places. Um, I, I, I mean, I'll, I'll go any place. So I'm not, uh, it, it's not that. It's, it's the culture that's here. 
It's, it's, and, and the culture is made up of you. Each one of you makes this place a special place. This is a special habitation of the Lord that he has done. There is something wonderful and unique that is going on here. And, and I'm, I'm not saying that out of flattery. I'm saying that out of shock and awe um, and, and honor. I, I honor you all for being a part of a family that reflects the nature and the character of Jesus here. Uh, the other thing, I, I've said this to a couple of people, and, and you've got to understand, I'm a hillbilly boy from Arkansas. So I, I you know, okay. And, and there's, there is a difference uh, between a redneck and a hillbilly. Rednecks are smarter than hillbillies. So I'm, I'm claiming my hillbilliousness. And, and maybe that's not politically correct anymore to say I don't know really what is or what isn't. So please forgive me if that hurt your feelings. But I really am a hillbilly boy. I was, I was born, I used to take my dates to a place called Booger Holler. <laughs> Mountain Dew was invented in my hometown. Um, it was, and it was originally called Kickapoo Joy Juice. They had to change the name to remarket it so it would go a little further than just my little place. My mama was on four episodes of the Beverly Hillbillies. So, so I really am a, a, a hillbilly. So you'll have to forgive me for my ignorance. Um, and, and then I have been traveling by the grace of God for the last 36 years, carrying the cross on foot around the world. So I really truly know much of the world like it's the the back of my hand however i really haven't spent much time in this part of oklahoma so this today is such a gift from god to my family and and we just want to say thank you for allowing us to be here pastor we honor you all and and just thanks for the invitation i appreciate it uh, there's also one other person that came with us, and it's, I call her my mom. Uh, my, my earthly mama passed away 11 or, or 8 years ago, and, uh, but, but I'm married to a fairy tale princess, so I guess that makes her the queen, but I don't like to call her the queen. She does, but in, in, a, in a movie, um, if you've ever watched movies, princesses are always fun, and, and the birds sing, even the mice sing and help them. The queens aren't always that way, so that's why I hesitate to call her the queen. But she's the mom of the princess, and she's sweet. And, and I, I love my mother-in-law. I love my mama, and she's here with us today. Um, so um, before I began, they asked if we had anything visually. So these guys, again, another incredible surprise I went back there, and I said, well, maybe, but it's, it's so late in the game. And I gave them something. You would have thought they're sending, you know, the, the lander to Jupiter or someplace. They, they were all on it, and they were able to do it. So just to give you an idea of walking around the world with a cross, we thought we'd show you this, and then I'll speak.
pray together. Jesus, you're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy of all honor, of all praise, of all glory, of all blessing and all power. And we give you glory. And we welcome you. You said apart from you, we can do nothing. And our best sermons and our best songs are nothing apart from your Holy Spirit. I need you this morning. But may my words not just be for them. May I minister to you. May I put a smile on your heart. I pray for every eye, every ear, and every heart to be open in this place. That we would fall helplessly, hopelessly, head over heels in love with you. If there's any who've never said yes to you, they'd see your beauty and want to follow you. For those, if there's any who've walked away or their love has grown cold, I pray that you'd revive first love. For those who are in love with you, I pray you'd fan the flames of love, that they would love you more deeply, more intensely, and more brightly. We welcome you. Glorify your name. In Jesus' name, amen. may be seated. You know, this journey, and I, I watch and I cry every one of those are stories that I remember. The journey has not been from, it's one mile after another, after another. It's been from one heart to the next. It's been from one person to the next. Jesus didn't ask me to carry the cross now 26,000 miles as of a week and a half ago. He didn't ask me to walk 26 miles. He didn't ask me to walk one mile with that cross. All he asked me to do, and all he asks you to do this morning, is to take the next step. That's all he asks. This morning, I want to honor Pastor, and he shared with me some things yesterday. I prayed, and I'm going to do my best. Um, I, I want to begin, and then I'll read scripture in just a moment. I want to begin by sharing a story. I had started carrying the cross, but most, most young ministers begin ministry as a youth pastor in youth camps. It's a long story, but I, I've never been drunk a day in my life. I've never smoked anything. First of all, self-righteousness. You know, you can be a murderer and you're the only one in the room who knows that you're a murderer. You, you can be a drug dealer and you're the only one who knows you're a drug dealer. But if you're a self-righteous person, everybody else knows and you're the only one who doesn't know. If that makes sense. And that was me. And, and so, I, when I fell in love with Jesus, I thought where I need to go is where there is need. It just... Why repeat the message over, recycle the message over and over again in the places where they've heard it over and over again? So my first ministry was overseas. I went to the Soviet Union at the time, what's now Russia, and they didn't have Bibles because it was communist. So I smuggled Bibles, and, and there's a lot of great stories that I'm going to have to skip today, but I got arrested. And I faced a two-and-a-half-year prison sentence because of Bibles. And somehow God did a, an incredible, crazy miracle, and I got out. But then when I came to the back home, I thought, where are lost people? And so I started going to bars and nightclubs to tell people about Jesus. And what I found surprised me because I had always condemned people there. 
But what I found is they're not monsters to be feared and creatures to run away from. They were kidnapped royalty. Men and women created to be sons and daughters of the king of all kings. And they'd been trapped by various things in their, in their life. And, and so it was, it was out of that that soon God called me to carry the cross. Some of the people I met uh, got in a fight. One of them was killed right in front of me. And my life was shaken. And so we, but we began to continue this ministry. And I was living in Shreveport, Louisiana for a short season. And on our way home one night, early one morning, about 3.30 or 4 in the morning, there were three other people in the car with me. We're going down the freeway, the expressway. And I noticed out of the corner of my eye a car that had, was on the side of the road, but I was tired. I was ready to get home. And somebody said, stop, that car is on fire. So I pulled over. And I looked, and indeed the car was on fire. Somehow they'd hit, spun around, they'd hit the median. The hood over the engine had come off. The windshield was caved in. The door on the driver's side was open. It was on the ground. Debris was scattered every place. And my friend said, we need to go help them. And I thought, I didn't say, the car's on fire. For some people, the car on fire causes them to run toward the fire. For others of us, it causes us to stay away. And I'm including us because that was me. Because I was afraid every car I'd ever seen on television or in the movies that catches on fire does what? It's dangerous. I already had an excuse. Number two, as we got close, we started moving toward the car, my friend and I. I saw that the driver was sitting on the floorboard. The car had crushed like this. He was sitting forward. He was bleeding profusely. There was blood. And I'm thinking, maybe he has a disease It's dangerous. Again, fire and blood. And so I said, hey, your car's on fire. Get out. And he said to me, hey, man, you don't want to party? Come party with me. And we said, man, your car's on fire. Get out. Blankety blank, leave me alone. Y'all a bunch of party poopers. He gave us an excuse. I don't want you to help me. And so I saw that if we're going to have to help him, we're going to have to reach in to the fire. Into the blood. And by now the fire is on the dashboard. I mean, it's, it's a big fire. Blood is every place. And so I started to reach in, and then I realized, and I'm sorry to tell you this, but this is the truth, I have on a new shirt. How selfish. We did reach in, and we did help him, and he did live. The ambulance arrived almost immediately after we had pulled it out of the, the fire. The car never exploded. It just went up in a whoosh. Shortly after we pulled him out, not even 30 seconds after we pulled him out, I did ruin my shirt. But that night, as, as I w- went into the, the restroom at my home, I looked in the, when, in the mirror, and it looked like I'd been in a battle. And looked like I had won. There was blood every place. My hair sticking up. My shirt is soaked and stained with blood. As I washed my hands, I felt the Lord Jesus spoke to my heart. My son, 
You can't wash your hands of the blood of a lost and dying world. I've called you. I've given you a picture. And tonight you saw it. The world thinks that they're having fun, but they're that far from eternal flames. And you make excuses with your life. And I've called you to reach in to the fires and pull them out. But I'm not able. Guys, I'm telling you, I'm a hilly boy from Arkansas who doesn't know enough. Puedo preguntar en español, pero mi gramática es muy malo. That's for all my friends that speak Spanish here. I just said I can preach in Spanish, but my, my grammar is really bad. I've, I've preached in Spanish and I've said, and Jesus will forgive all your fish. <laughs> the word in Spanish for sin is pecados. The word for fish is pescados. It sure sounded a whole lot the same to me. I've told some guys in a jungle that I was having, they, they, you saw the picture of them on the screen, the guys that were wearing the little ropes and the, the brooms in front. I told them that I, I was pregnant and I was having romantic feelings for them. <laughs> I'm a hillbilly boy from Arkansas and I've got a whole lot of excuses why I can't do this. Maybe, maybe the best picture of overcoming my excuses, though, I was still living in Shreveport, Louisiana. And while we were living there, we would go to all of the, um, the rock and roll concerts, uh, any kind of concert that they had. And we were able to go inside. We, we had favor, and we were able to go inside. We spoke with all the groups of the, the 80s and the 90s, uh, the early 2000s. Any, any name that you name, we probably had the privilege of speaking to them about Jesus. But outside, we would do this drama. So when everybody came out, we would have this drama. And, and let me just tell you, we're not good actors. We would make as much noise and action, try to get the people to come and look at us and watch us and, and see what we were doing. And <laughs> um, we might have you know, 10 at most 15 people watched. It was very G-rated, and you're at an R-rated concert. So why would they even want to stop? But this night was a little bit different. The name of this drama that we were doing was called The Bucket of Sin. And it's called The Bucket of Sin because we had a bucket and we wrote sin all around it. We filled the bucket full of packing peanuts, the little styrofoam peanuts, and... A buddy and me would walk by the bucket, and we would see it, and we would say, wow, what's that? And we would finally decide that it is a bucket of sin, but we would say, but my mama told me to stay away from sin. The preacher told me to stay away from sin, but doesn't it look good? And so we would sneak a little closer to it. We would sneak a little bit closer to it, just like so many of us, we get in. We're just going to touch the bucket. We're going to get close to the bucket. And he says, I dare you to put your hand in it. And I dare him and he dares me, just like we do in life. And finally, I put my hand in the bucket and I go, <laughs> because the Bible tells us that sin is pleasurable for a season. And then he says, let me, let me. And he puts his hand in, <laughs> And we're both trying to <laughs> as loud as we can to get a crowd. That's not working. We've got a few people just laughing and watching. And he says, I dare you to get in. And finally, I act like nobody's looking. And isn't that what we do? We make sure nobody's looking when we're getting ready to sin. And I put one leg in. And I just shiver. It's just, <laughs> oh. And he goes, come on, come on. And so I step and I'm in the bucket, and I'm just, mm, oh, this is, oh. he goes, get out, let me, let me. But what happens when you get in sin? You can't get out. So I'm stuck in the bucket. And what do your friends do when you get stuck? Bye. It was fun knowing you. And so this is where the drama really starts. 
So I tried to get out. Help! Get me out of this bucket! And I can't get out. But part of the drama is we have a pretty girl. She's all dressed up. She looks like all the people, the pretty girls going into the concert. And she walks up to me and she goes, I can get you out of that. And she gives me a big kiss. But wrong relationships don't get you out of your sin. What do they do? To use an Arkansas word, they get you stuckerer. <laughs> then some guys come along in their suits and they've got their briefcases. They're not real. $1,500 bills hanging out. And they say, listen, give yourself to this and you'll get out. But the love of money is the root of all evil. We think it will make us happy, but you get stuck rurer. And you can't get out. Some other guys come along and they've got needles and they've got bottles and they've got packets of powder. It's a party. Dude, you'll never get out, but you might as well have a good time while you're in your bucket. But what happens when the party's over? You're stuck rurist. You're more stuck. Help, get me out of here. And then my buddy is supposed to come along. And in the drama, he is supposed to have given his life to Jesus. And he's going to come back and he's going to tell me how I can give my life to Jesus and get out of the bucket. But it didn't happen that way this night. Because in the crowd was somebody who had been partying inside. And he hadn't been doing a drama. He had been the group three. He might have done all of the groups that evening. But he was stuck in his life. He had probably just partaken of the party on the inside. He was high. Let's just say it that way. He was real high. And he saw me and he said, I can't say it in church, so I'll say it this way. Blankety blank. Sin. Dude. Blankety blank. I said, let me out. I'll blank and get you out. So it reaches around me. I know if I pop out of the bucket, the drum is over. So he starts to pull me. I brace my feet. The bucket comes up, but I'm stuck in the bucket. Down. Blankety blank, you are stuck. I told you. I'll blank and get you out. He sits on the bucket. He tries to pull me. I'm bracing. Blankety blank. I mean, I, I, I'm hearing words I've never heard before. I think they're bad. Maybe not, but I don't know him. And he starts to walk away. And he gets a little, about this far from me. And he yells, I'll blank and get you out. Oh, no. <laughs> he comes like a middle linebacker over the, hunting the quarterback. Whoa. I know if I come out of the bucket, the door's over, so I'm bracing. I hit the ground, tear my shirt, cut my face, my ears, but I didn't come out. Blankety blank, you're stuck. I said, I told you, I'm trying to get out. I said, can you give me a hand, get me up? So he stands me up. He, he starts to walk, and he goes, oh, dude, sin. Blankety blank. Sin. And he looks at me like the light bulb just went on. And he goes, you need to blank and give your life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> I said, pardon me? <laughs> he goes, you blankety blank and need to give your life to Jesus Christ. I said, what do you mean? He goes, don't you know, dude, Jesus blankety blank and died on a blanking cross. <laughs> Never heard the gospel quite like this. I said, that's it? No. Blankety blank. He blankety blank and rose again. I said, I'm still in my, my, my bucket. He goes, you blankety need to pray. 
I said, what do you mean? He goes, repeat after me. <laughs> God have mercy on me for what I said. <laughs> Let me just tell you, our, our drama has been G-rated. This night, we, we, we moved up. We're at least PG-13. We might have been scratched and rated. I mean, we've got blood, we've got violence, we've got language. We've got all the parental controls going there. And I got out of my bucket. And instead of 10 or 15 people, we've got almost 200 people watching us. And I put my arm around him and I said, you can't see it. But I think every one of these people are stuck in their bucket. And would you just tell all of them what you just told me? And this young man shared with this crowd the gospel of Jesus Christ with a lot of extra words, but in a very clear way. And because of his story, over 40 people got out of their buckets that night. I come back to, I don't know enough to get people out of their cars that are on fire. I don't know enough to get people out of the buckets. But if God can use that, how much more can he use you or me? If he could use that God presentation that was full of profanity, how much more can he use your presentation? What are, you, what are your excuses? What are my excuses? I, I'm going to ruin my clothes. I don't, I don't have enough time. I'm just going to drive by and pretend I don't see it. Because I did see that wreck. I didn't see somebody that was in there, but I knew something had happened. And how many times, my friends, do we drive down the road of life and we pretend we don't see? And we know that the flames of eternity are real. How many times do we say, I can't do it because I don't have enough time, I don't know enough, I don't have the right resources, or fill in the blank, whatever excuse we might use. If God can use that man, he can use me. This hillbilly boy from Arkansas who's shy, more, probably more shy than anybody in this room, more insecure probably than anybody in this room, but it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. And, and somehow, some way, we have lost Jesus in the church. See, I see so many of my friends that I started out in ministry with that are no longer in the ministry. Not long ago, I was with a friend. I used to be in TBN a whole lot. And this man was on TBN and he was one of my heroes. I met with him in a crack house in Tulsa. I went to visit with him. He gave me a call on his cell phone and he said, I need you to come see me. And, and pastor friends of mine that start out no longer believe in Jesus. They say everybody's going to heaven. I wonder how, how does this happen? What happens is not careful, we get focused on the buckets and the car wrecks and even the people more than we do Jesus. And, and see, the way that that happens so often is sometimes you can be around something so much, so long that you never see it. My friends, if if souls is what drives you, you will dry up. If evangelism and missions or discipleship or worship or prayer or revival or spiritual warfare is what drives you, you will dry up. I'm more excited about the one who fights for us than I am about the battle. I'm more excited about the one we get to talk to than the one that prayer is all about. I'm, I'm, I'm more excited about the one who is coming than the second coming. You understand what I'm saying? 
I'm more excited about the one who shed his blood than about the blood. See, we, we focus on all these little things and we miss the truth. I mentioned that I was smuggling Bibles in Eastern Europe. And I'll never forget one of the first times I went to Eastern Europe. And I was invited to speak in a church where they had no Bibles. I mean, I've been in places where I've seen handwritten Bibles. There was only one handwritten Bible in some churches. One Bible and it was all handwritten. Other places, different people had memorized portions of Scripture. You, you might have the book of John memorized. You guys may have the book of Psalms. That's a big one. You may have to have the book of Revelation. You've got Daniel memorized. So they came together because they would borrow a Bible from another city and they would memorize it so they would have a Bible at least by heart. And so I'm invited to this church. They, it's an underground church. It's a secret meeting. And I'm sitting in a chair, and so I'm, as I'm sitting there, I put my Bible on the floor. And this young man came, very respectfully came to me, and with tears in his eyes, he said, I can't imagine not having a Bible. I, I can't imagine owning something as precious as that. I said, it is a privilege. And he says, Please don't think I'm being disrespectful. But if I own something as precious as that, as beautiful as that, I can't imagine that I just put it on the floor. And I hold it for you until you're ready to use it so it doesn't have to be on the floor. See, we grow up around Bibles, so we just put them every place. And we take it for granted. And sometimes we don't even read them. We don't even open them. Because we've been around the Bible. The cross. (laughs) I'm walking down the road. How many times do I walk down the road and someone comes up and says, what are you doing? I said, what do you think I'm doing? They said, some places, let me say, they've never, ever, ever, ever seen a cross. Can you imagine? I was in one little village in Asia, and they gathered around and through the interpreter. I said, what do you think I'm doing? They talked among themselves. Then back through the interpreter, they said, we know what you're doing. You're a famous athlete, a famous sportsman from America. You are like Michael Jordan and LeBron James. I said, well, there's a lot of ways I'm not like Michael or LeBron. And I said, have you ever heard of someone by the name of Jesus? And then this time, they, a few of them run off to every little hut, every little store, and they come back out of breath. No, sir, nobody by that name has ever visited us. Never, ever, ever, ever heard the name of Jesus. 3.2 billion, with a B, people in our world have never, ever, ever heard his name. They don't know what this is. But there are others of us, we see them all the time. So people will come and, what do you think I'm doing? I said, what do you think? Well, you're carrying a cross. I said, that's, that's right. Why are you carrying a cross? And I'll say, what do you think about? Is it okay if I come down? What do you think about when you see a cross? And almost everybody will say, I think about Jesus. I say, that, that's wonderful. And I'm not trying to trick you, but I don't believe you. They said, what do you mean? I say, you see a, a beautiful lady, and she's on the red carpet, and she's dressed just really fancy, and she's got a, a gold and diamond cross right here. What do you think about? Do you think about Jesus? And almost every one of them says, no. At best, it's a decoration. Okay? And, and you drive by the cemetery, and you see hundreds of crosses. Do you think about Jesus? 
You know, I think about all the people that have gone before me. Before Messi or Ronaldo kicks a goal, what do they do? You watch a baseball player before he bats, what does he do? Do you think about Jesus? No, he wants to knock it out of the park. He wants to kick the goal, right? And I said, and, and you drive by the, down the road and you see a building with stained glass and one of these on top of it. Do you think about Jesus? 99% of the time, they say, no. I think about what kind of religion is in that building. Not even what kind of Christianity, what kind of religion. And do you know what the answer I get most of the time? No, I think about politics or money. See, we have so many crosses that we no longer see the cross. First time I was ever in jail, Yugoslavia, they asked me all kinds of questions for three days. Hardly had any sleep. They want to know all about me and all about what I'm doing and why I'm there. They're trying to keep me there longer. And the Bible says, don't worry, because God will give you the right words. And finally, I said, oh, please forgive me. I've been with you all these days, and I haven't even asked you anything. Could, could you tell me why I'm here? They said, oh, don't you know in a communist country... You're not allowed to publicly display your faith. And I knew exactly what to say. I said, I've been walking with your cross for days in your country. And I've seen people with all kinds of crosses around their neck. Gold, wood, silver. I've seen them bronze. I've seen big ones, little ones, in-between ones. I've even seen them on top of buildings. And as I've walked down the road, I've seen telephone poles. And they look like crosses. I said, is my crime the size of my cross? Because if it's not, either you need to go arrest all those thousands of people and take down all your telephone poles, or you need to let me go. See, they'd seen the cross, but they hadn't seen the cross. We've seen the Bibles, but we haven't seen the Bible. Sometimes you can see something so much you no longer see it anymore. So we see evangelism. We see outreach. We see spiritual warfare. But it's just another box to tick off. I'll never forget Nairobi, Kenya, walking in there. Thousands upon thousands of people. So many that I couldn't walk. City transport shut down. And we would just lift up the cross and preach. And it was awesome. And as I get ready to put the cross on my shoulder to move forward again, the crowd parts. And it was just beautiful. Because two men are leading a man with a cane, with a white cane. He was blind. I had the cross like this as my pulpit. The people moved and he came up. He handed the cane to one of his friends and he stuck out his hands for me to grab his. He said, Mr., I heard that you had a cross. I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, I've always wanted to see a cross. Remember, he's a blind man. I said, I'd be honored to show one to you. And I took his hands and I placed them on the cross. And tears began to run down his face. And for the next, in some ways it seemed like seconds, in some ways it seemed like eternity. For the next amount of time that I don't know how much, the crowd went silent because it was such a holy moment. Because someone was seeing the cross. This man did every tiny millimeter of this cross twice. And he st- Got back up, he felt the cross beam, he took a step back, held out his hands for me to grab his hands. Tears just running down his face and it seemed like everybody else. He said, thank you. Now, I've seen the cross. 
Is the Bible just another book? Is prayer just another exercise? See, my friends, it's possible to sing and not worship. Your mind is on a hundred different things. It's possible to read the Bible and not remember a thing that you read because you did your devotions without devotion. It's possible to go tell somebody about Jesus and miss the love that's to be behind it. We were doing an outreach in a desire project in New Orleans. Again, we'd hold up the cross, we did a drama, and then we'd go out and, and speak with people. And this one young man, I said, if you die right now, do you know for sure you'd go to heaven? See, I learned that because that's what you're supposed to say. But here's what I found. When you learn something, they don't always learn what they're supposed to say. People always say the different things. And this guy didn't say what he was supposed to say. He said, you don't mean that. He used the blankety blanks too. You don't mean a word that you're saying. I said, I, I do. Look, it's a dangerous neighborhood. Two little girls had been, died, had been killed in a crossfire the night before. Two 10-year-old little girls. Gang battle right there. I said, it's dangerous. He goes, you don't mean it. Come with me. And we went down an alley, a dead-end alley. And I should have known better. I've been on the streets long enough. I should know better than to go with somebody into an alley I don't know that doesn't have an exit. And he points where a car had been parked overnight. He says, wipe your hands in that. Kneel down and wipe your hands in that. But it wasn't a car that had been parked overnight. Because it wasn't oil. It was blood. He began to shake. He began to cry. He began to scream. He began to curse. He said, that was my brother. Last night, in a drug deal gone bad, 15 bullets point blank. He goes, and I don't know where my brother is. And I don't know where I'm going if that's me tonight. He said, that could be me. And I don't need some big shot preacher coming through here, just going through the motions, trying to get another notch on his belt and make everybody think that he's more important. He goes, I need to know the answer, preacher. Tell me, ask me that question again, and now mean it. How many times do we just go through the motions? How many times, my friends, Jesus, we don't see him. We're, we're around Jesus and jesus -y things, but we miss Jesus. And you say, that's impossible. No, it's not. Remember the woman with the issue of blood? She touches him, just the hem of his garment, not even his skin. She touches the tip of his clothes. And he says, somebody touch me. And the disciples, do you remember what they say? Every one of them said, Jesus, everybody's touching you. You say, somebody touched me? He goes, yes, somebody touched me. I felt power go out of me. See, someone touched him. Everyone bumped into him. Have you bumped into him, but have you not touched him? When's the last time you've really seen Jesus? Jesus. Jesus said, you search the scriptures, John chapter 5, verse 39, because in these you think that you might have life. But he says, but you're unwilling to come to me. Did you know it's possible to study and, and search the scriptures and not come to Jesus? My verse for today. This is in John chapter 14, verses 8 and verses 9. And Philip says to Jesus, show us the Father, and it's enough. And it doesn't say this, but I think this would be true because of the answer. I think with tears in his eyes, 
Jesus turns to Philip. And this is what the Bible says. He says, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? Hearing messages on outreach and evangelism might get me out there, but they're not going to keep me going. Hearing beautiful songs about God's love for the world, his care for the lost, might get me out there, but they're not going to keep me going. A prayer meeting might get me out there, but it's not going to keep me going. Because then the outreach becomes about the outreach. The prayer meeting becomes about the prayer meeting. The Bible study becomes about the Bible. And somehow we miss Jesus. And the Bible says, apart from me, you can do nothing. So if you don't mind, I'll close my message with two stories. I was carrying my cross from Panama to Mexico. It's a long walk. In the 1980s, there was war in every country except Costa Rica. There was war in Panama. You saw a picture of me getting out of jail in Panama. That was when Noriega was in power. There was war in Nicaragua, in El Salvador, in Honduras, and Guatemala. I didn't even know it, but at that time, in the southernmost state of Mexico, in Chiapas, there was war. That's where I was taken before a firing squad, and that's a... Story for another time. But as I walked, I met a man who came up to me and he wanted to carry my cross. This was in Nicaragua. He wanted to carry my cross. And I said, of course, I'm going to walk with him. It's a great opportunity to walk together. And he says, I'm a bad man. I'm a bad man. I said, that's, that's okay. He said, no, I'm a really bad man. I said, that's okay. He didn't have socks on, but he took off his shoes. And he rolled up his pants above his knees. And he started carrying my cross. In that part of the world, there's something called penance, penitencia. In fact, many people think when I'm carrying the cross, it's a penitencia or promesa. It's a promise that I've made to God for something. Or I'm trying to be absolved or forgiven for my sins. And so he's trying to be absolved because he's a bad man. He wants to get forgiveness because his burden of sin is so heavy. And so as he starts to carry the cross, he tells me all the bad things he's done. Every bad thing you can think of, he did it. And probably more. And he's just confessing it. But remember, he's walking barefoot carrying the cross. With his pant legs rolled up here. And any time he would see something sharp. It didn't matter if it was thorn bushes, sharp stones. He would make sure that he stepped on it as he carries the cross. Metal, like a can that was torn, he would make sure he stepped on it. Even at one time, he saw broken glass and he got down on his knees And he's walking on his knees on that broken glass, carrying the cross. And I keep saying, you don't have to do this. Jesus carried your cross. You don't have to bleed. Jesus bled for you. You don't have to hurt yourself. Jesus was hurt for you. He shed his blood so you can be forgiven. And all you have to do is receive that. He walked with me for almost 50 kilometers, about eight miles, nine miles. We got to the top of a high hill. I've never seen a guy get more saved than this man. He didn't repeat a sinner's prayer. He didn't come forward in a church for an invitation. He didn't sign a card. On the top of that hill, he gave me the cross, leaned it back. He says, you mean I didn't have to carry this? 
I said, no, Jesus already carried your cross. You mean I didn't have to walk that far? I said, no, I told you back when we began, you don't have to do it. I didn't have to hurt myself and bleed. No, Jesus did that for you. And he's, and he's alive and I can know him? Said, Isn't that the most awesome thing? That not only can you be forgiven, but because he's alive, you can know him? And this guy jumps in the air, kicks his heels together, both hands go up, and he goes, Yahoo! And he runs down the hill, both hands high in the air. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. I thought, God, forgive me. Because I'm free too. But somehow something got lost in in there. Oh, have you ever been set free from your sins? Oh, brother, praise the Lord, me too. Thank God I'm free. Glory to God. (laughs) See, that's all it takes is here I am. Here I am. And that's what that man said. But we become so good at all of this. And then it becomes another thing. And then so we, we do it to make pastor happy. We do it because, well, we want to get... That's what a good Christian does, and we read it in the Bible, and the Bible says it, and I believe it, and I'm going to do it by God. <laughs> but there's, there's no joy. Do you know why I share about Jesus? Because I'm free. Do, do you want to know t- today how much you love God? I, I'm just going to tell you real quick. If you want to know how much you really, really love God, He says, whatever you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. How can you say you love God whom you haven't seen if you can't love your brother whom you have seen? So think of the person whom you love the least, and that's how much you love God. That's biblical. It's not preached, but it's in the Bible. Whatever, whatever, that means whatever, love. But if your love for him is overflowing, guess what? You're going to see them. You're going to be looking for him in them. You're going to be looking for his fingerprints in every person that you meet. And you look at people for their potential, not for what they did wrong, but what they can do. Walking across the Gobi Desert in Mongolia till 1994, no zero, none believers in the whole nation. To this day, there's many, many people who've never yet heard his name. Gobi Desert's flat. It's not like the Sahara. It's not as hot either. And as I'm walking, uh, the only people who visit there are dinosaur bone hunters, uh, adventure tourists, and the nomads who live there. This Mongolia is the land of Genghis Khan. They call him Chinkis Khan. And I hear a motorbike. We're walking to a town called Dalanzagad. We hear a motorbike, and we look, and this guy is so happy. He's waving us down, and he's coming right at us. The only other thing out there, they've got lots of camels, the two hump kind. And so he sees us, waves us down. He goes, he he looks like Genghis Khan. He's got a big bushy beard. And he says, you're the man. I like to think so. Uh, But he, you're, you're the man, you're the man. He said, I saw someone in a dream last night who told me I was going to meet you. I said, tell me who you met. He said, I can't tell you because I couldn't look at him. When I looked at him, it was like looking at the sun, but it was brighter. And he spoke to me, and I could hear his words, but it was like waterfalls. He said, the only thing I could see were his feet, and he had scabs on his feet. And he was carrying one of these. And he said, tomorrow... You will meet someone who's carrying one of these who will explain what this is and why it's so important and who I am. And he goes, you're the man. And I had the privilege of sharing who Jesus is, why he came, what he did, and how you can know him personally. And this big Genghis Khan man who, I I know some of you have good beards here. I've seen a couple of you. A few years ago, it was Duck Dynasty made him really the rage. But the thing about a beard is it shows why we need to wear masks. 
If you've ever looked at somebody's big bushy beard, you see why a mask wearing is important because they've all got all the spit in their beard. And some guys don't just have spit in their beard, they have food. Some people I've met have picnics in their beard. This guy had at least two days worth of picnic in his beard. And it was all wet and moist and lots of spit in there. But he's happy and he grabs me. And you know, some cultures are different than others. But he grabs me around both shoulders. Big old guy, bushy beard. Oh, I don't know if it's good or bad. Oh, and then he starts crying. When I cry, it just runs down my face, by my nose. Sometimes out here. Ladies, I know it's all the way across for you. This guy, and I've only seen it one other time since then, never before, so it was a surprise. He was like water, uh, like windshield wipers, the squirt. He was squirting me with his tears. So you got the picture, big bushy beard, couple days worth of picnic. He's grabbed me by the shoulder. He's given me a little shower. Oh, and then he goes, takes it up a notch. Oh, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. And then he just loses it, starts to <laughs> cry hard. And he goes, this is, this is. And then, I don't know if you say it, the coupe de grace, whatever that word is, he pulls me right to his mouth, right through the fur, right through the spit, right through the picnic, kisses me right on the mouth. And he's holding me. And I'm going, And he puts me down and he goes, this is, this is, this is happy news. See, he saw Jesus. God forgive us because we've made it the good news. My friends, have you made the message of a king who came to this earth and lived here 33 years without sin. God in the flesh. Have you made him just theology and doctrine and belief and religion? Oh, I know. It's all about a relationship, not a religion. God is good all the time, all the time. God is good. We can say those in our sleep. It's just a cross, it's got the Bible, just prayers. My friends, this is. Happy news. This is hug your neighbor, kiss him right through your furry face, kiss him right, and jump and kick your heels. And I'm free, I'm free. Something amazing has happened to me. You're not going to believe it, and it can happen for you because I'm in love. And here's the thing when you're in love, you want to tell everybody about it. You want to tell the world, I love that woman right over there. I promise you, fellas. Please love your wife more than I love her because I'm a competitor and I want you to challenge me. I mean, I want to win her heart at the end of every day, not just won it so many years back. I want to win it every day. And Jesus wants to win your heart every day. Because he, when he's got someone whose heart is completely his, he has someone he can reach all the world through. And that's what he's looking for today. Yeah, I've got a lot of excuses because I'm messed up. I'm selfish and I'm busy and I don't know enough. I, I, I could run through all the excuses, but it's not about me and it's not about my excuses. And if God could use that guy, that drunk guy, that blankety blank guy in Shreveport, Louisiana, because he saw something. He can use you and he can use me. And when you fall in love, you don't just get a glance. You, you want to see another glance and you want to see another glance. And then finally you want to work your way up. I mean, I just love to look in her eyes. I love to hold her. I love to hold her hand. If, if you watch us while we're worshiping, you, you might need to give us a yellow card because we're, we're, we're holding hands. We'll kiss a lot of times even during worship. But I guarantee you this, just as I've challenged all of you fellas to outlove your princesses more than I love her.
her. I want to challenge all of you to outlove Jesus to me. Because I want to give you a run for your money. Your witnessing is going to be far better than mine. Your preaching is going to be way better than mine. But it's not about how good I preach. It's not about how well I witness. It's not even about how well I can sing or not sing. It's not how well I can pray or not pray. One of my friends who wasn't even a believer led, offered to, he was asked to lead prayer for a key club in high school. Bow your heads, everybody. We all bowed our heads and Carl didn't say anything and he didn't say anything. Didn't say anything. And finally he said, in Jesus' name, amen. He goes, I wasn't talking to you all. He wasn't a believer. I got the message. It's not about me and it's not about you. And he's the thing that's going to keep us going. He's the one who holds all this together. And my prayer is that you set your eyes on him. Philip, have I been with you so long and you still don't know me? Church, you're a beautiful place in this community. You're a light. But has he been with you so long and you still don't know him? Not saved, not born again. I'm not talking about that. Know him. May we all stand. King Jesus, we stand in honor of you. And we worship you. You create every part. You know where everybody is. And it's not by might. It's not by power. It's by your spirit. And we've heard hundreds of sermons. So it's not about sermons. It's not about the music that's playing. But it's about what you're saying to each heart. So I'm going to talk to your children for just a moment. Folks, I started out to this, this morning praying. And I prayed for some hearts who have never taken a look, taken a glance at Jesus, or at best taken a glance. Let me just say, he loves you. And he'll do whatever it takes to capture your heart. Even die a horrible death on a horrible cross. With flies all around and people cursing him. And yet saying from the cross, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. But he loves you so much he didn't stay in the grave. He's alive and he's knocking on the door of your heart. And there's others of you, you've had experiences with him. And you've gone up the mountain and down the mountain. You've gone up the mountain and you slipped down on the other side. Some of you are just tired. You're tired of trying to do the right thing. You get in this home group or you get in this Bible study. And, or you listen to this message online. And, and it works for a few days. But here we off. Jesus is asking you to do is come lean your head on his chest around you. And he says, come to me all you are weary and heavy laden. Your heart burned at one time, but no longer is it burning. He's the one who brings the fire. You're tired of lighting the fire and it going out. He's the one who baptizes with fire. And there are others in this room that you've walked with God. But you're hearing today something fresh. And the wind, you're, you feel the wind of the Holy Spirit. You, you're sensing the oil of the Holy Spirit resting on that fire. And that your fire is, is just, you said, I want more. So I'm not going to ask you to come forward today. Sometimes we come forward but we don't go out. Does that make sense? <laughs> sometimes I think, I'm getting old, so I think I can say this. I think sometimes, it's not always, 
And, and so don't judge anybody by what I'm going to say. But we ask people to come forward because it makes us feel as preachers. Sometimes there's an act that needs to come forward. But Jesus never asked people to come forward. He sent them out. And so today what I'm going to ask is surrender. And in the world, how do you surrender? Both arms go up. Not one hand. Jesus never said every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. He didn't do that. Let me just tell you what he says. He says, I'll give you eternal life. I'll give you forgiveness. I'll give you a clean heart, not just a clean heart, a new heart. The old things will pass away. Everything will become new. You'll become a new, the Bible says, creation. Yeah, you get that. You get you get love that's unconditional. You get peace that is beyond understanding. You get joy that you can't even describe. But you also get persecutions and misunderstandings. You might lose your job. You might lose your life. But you get Jesus. And he promised to be with you always. Even to the ends of the earth. Even to the valley of shadow of death. There's no heaven without Jesus. So many of us want to go to heaven, but we don't want Jesus. Heaven starts now. As so earlier, I mentioned three kinds of people. Far away, never started, and already on fire, but you just say, I need more. In the world, you surrender, both hands go up, you lose everything. In God's kingdom, both hands go up, you get everything. You say, I want to surrender. Lift up your hand. Don't lift them up and yes, you're willing to surrender. But if God's speaking to you this morning, both hands high. Both hands high. I'm not going to lead you in a prayer. I recently spoke, and this guy came up, he said, the sinner prayer saves, brother. I said, no, the sinner's prayer didn't die on a cross for me. Jesus saves. I can I tell you story after story of people who got saved. Both of those men that I mentioned, Mongolia and Nicaragua, are pastors today. They never repeated a prayer. They prayed from their hearts. If you need Jesus right now across this room, talk to him. Just tell him. Tell him where you are. Tell him what's going on in your life. But cry out for him. See, I, I hunger and I thirst for you. Those that hunger and thirst are filled. As the deer pants after the water, so my soul longs after the Lord. So Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to rest on this house. To rest on this family on every person that makes this place up. Lord, we don't seek an experience. We don't seek emotions. We're thankful for every emotion you give us. For those who are crying, for those who are laughing, for those who are being touched, for those who are just standing there. We thank you. But we thank you that your Holy Spirit begins and finishes the work. That you are the author and the finisher. And that you're faithful to complete what you begin in us. Would you give everyone the grace to fix their eyes on you who endured the cross for the joy set before you, despising the shame. Oh, let people look into your eyes and may they see your beauty. Bless my friends. Bless this family in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. As we go into worship just for a few moments here this morning, listen, I want you to know that there's a, there, there's a deposit being made from heaven into every heart that's in this place today. This is more than a message, but literally it is, it is literally a release from heaven, stirring the hearts of the people of God. We are not in this world to live for ourselves. We are in this world to carry forth the name the person of Jesus. This week, there's family members that need to see the Jesus that you carry. 
There's co-workers this week that need to see the Jesus that you carry. So this is a deposit today. This is a deposit today. It's a stirring by the Spirit of God into every person that is in this place today. The world has always been crazy. It's not like it's so different. It's always been crazy. But there is a voice in the wilderness. There is a mercy and a grace from the throne of heaven that flows through the message of Jesus that you carry. And the world's looking for it. So let's worship just for a few moments as we conclude this service. I appreciate your patience today, but there's something that God is doing in your heart. Something that's taking place within this house today. So for a few moments, would you please just surrender everything that Keith said. Just be in a place of surrender. Come on, let's worship. Father, that's our prayer. We fall in love with you, fresh and anew. That God, I thank you and I praise you that within the heart of every person, within the sound of our voice today, that God, that literally there would be a higher level of surrender unto you. That God, there's a world that's waiting on the church. The church is not waiting on the world, but the world is waiting on the church. And God, I thank you and I praise you in the hour that we live in, in such a desperate time in the world. I thank you and I praise you that the message of light and of love and of Jesus begins to go forth from this place. God, today is ascending forth. It's ascending forth in this season. It's a raising up of the evangelist within the, within the heart of every person. Just as Paul laid hands on Timothy, he said, I stir up. I stir up the gift of evangelism. I stir this up within you. That God, I thank you and I praise you. Our, our name may not be Timothy, but I thank you and I praise you for that strong presence that was saying in that hour, in that time, I need the heart of the evangelist to come forth. And so, Father, I thank you in this hour that you're stirring our hearts, that you're lighting a fire within us. And I want to say this with every person that may be here today, that you may be away from the Lord. You're not near as far away as what you may think that you are. If you've never declared Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I believe that just in the hearing of the word today, your faith is arising. And you need to go to someone today and say, Jesus is the Lord of my life. Make that your confession. And upon that confession of leave upon your heart, you shall be born again. You make that step today. This week, I'm encouraging you, go find a point of light. 
Go find, a, go find a point of life that you can pour your heart into this week and watch God begin to do miracles. Come on, if you receive this today, can we give God praise because he's the one that deserves all glory. He deserves all honor and he deserves all praise. If you receive from the gift that was in the house today through Keith, would you please just give God praise and just let Keith know how much you appreciate him as well. Amen. Amen. Father, I bless every home. I bless every individual that's here today. God, we continue to carry worship. We continue to share the love of Jesus with those that we come in contact with. God, I thank you for a week of encouragement, a week of strength. God, for those that are in this place that need breakthrough in their life, I thank you that the God of breakthrough is already visiting their home. I thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit that is surrounding them and filling every vessel. They can see God be only who you who you are to every person in this place. God bless them, keep them in the mighty name of Jesus. Everybody said Amen. Do this today. Would you share the love of Jesus with three or four people before you leave? Amen. God bless you. You have an incredible week. Have an incredible week. Amen.